Hello everyone, King Shook here. Let's continue with Euclidean geometry. Now, I had decided to start off with the postulates and uh, axioms, definitions, and so on in the first book, but then I retreated back to the discussion of or the details of definitions because the definitions are the most basic things about the subject, so we need to know more about it. Now, once we are talking about definition, the name Aristotle must come in. So, in the book we have, there is nothing in connection with definitions which as Aristotle takes more pains to emphasize than that the fact that a definition asserts nothing as to the existence or the non-existence of the thing defined. For example, the answer to the question what is a man and the fact that a man exists, they are completely different things. So, the definition of man does not say that man exists. We will either have to assume that later on by our postulates or axioms or whatever or we will have to prove them by some theorems. So, that is the most basic thing about what a definition does not do. So, now a definition is a mere identical proposition which gives more information only about the use of language and from which no conclusion affecting the matters of the fact can possibly be drawn. So, of course, it is clear that I am using this word for this thing which I see in physical eyes or feel or do whatever with that. We are using some words to describe them and to, uh, discuss the matters. So, we will have to say the meaning of the words and definition does precisely that thing. And the accompanying postulate on the other hand affirms that a, pa that a fact may lead to consequences of every degree of importance. So, when we are assuming that this is true, this is happening and this exists, the defined thing exists, then that is a postulate and that postulate gives all sorts, all sorts of important things that like if we did not assume that a line exists, we will be not able to do any geometry with that because well, if they say us to draw a line, <laughs> then we do not know that if a line exists or not, no question about that. So, the postulate following that gives the all sort of information on uh, enables us to do everything, but the definition only says the meaning of the terminology in use, so to speak in layman terms. Now, Mr. Leibniz, of course, Wilhelm Leibniz has also something to say about it. If we give any definition and it is not clear from it that the idea which we ascribe to the thing is possible, we cannot really rely upon the demonstrations which we have derived from that definition or in simple terms we define a straight line but we do not assume that the straight line exists or we do not prove that it exists and still we use the definition of a straight line to draw lines whatever draw equilateral triangles proof theorems but when time comes and we prove that the straight line does not exist if that was the case then all the things we have proved would be just vanished. So, we have to first know that the thing exists in order to use it in further problems or theorems or any propositions. So that is one extremely important thing that we do not go into some sort of circular reasoning. Because if that idea by chance involves a contradiction, it is possible that the even contradictories may be true of it at one and the same time and thus our demonstration will be useless. So that is what Leibniz says. Leibniz's favorite il favorite illustration was a regular polyhedron with 10 faces. Yes, very nice. Suppose we have 10, um, ten some sort of surfaces and uh, 10 decagons and you cannot form any sort of a polyhedron or a closed thing which we call polyhedra. You cannot form any polyhedra out of those 10 decagons or a regular polyhedron with 10 faces does not exist which in the primary sense is not obvious that it does not exist. So, if we just assume that it exists and do whatever with it, then we will understand that it does not exist and we will have to change all of our conclusions from that. So, that is one very good example by Mr. Leibniz. But when we will go to Euclid's definitions, Euclid's definitions and this use of them, the agreeing with the doctrine of Aristotle and all sorts of things are perfectly in balance just to create the genus of the beautiful geometry. So, now we move on to Aristotle's 
three requirements of definition. First of all, the different attributes in a definition when taken separately cover more than the notion defined, but the combination of them does not. This is an extremely important thing. Suppose in the definition of a square, there there are several notions of a figure, four sided, equilateral that means all sides are equal, a right angle, it has a right angle in it and all sorts of things which covers several topics. Something is something is a figure, something is four sided, something is equilateral, something is a right angle. But when we enter all that, we get a mere square which we see every day. It is like that. A good proof teaches more than the theorem. It is pretty much like that. Second, a definition must be expressed in terms of thing which is which are prior to and better known than the thing defined. Of course, if we do not know about straight lines, there is no question that we will define squares and rectangles and parallelograms. That is impossible. And that is how we have to state the meaning of the words in terms of the thing we previously knew. You do not know square and all of a sudden I say that the, the square on the diagonal of a square is double of the previous square, then it will just go above your head. The terms prior and better known are as usual susceptible of two meanings, two meanings. First of all logically prior and then prior relatively to us. In absolute sense from the standpoints of reason or logic or real mathematics, the the thing which is prior is actually better known than the thing we are next defining which is like the beginning of things. In this logical priority point is better known than a line and line is better known than a surface, surface is better known than a solid. But when we come to the priority related to us, we see that the solids are more common to us like a, a cubic dice, <laughs> it is much more common, we play with it every day. And then we go to a surface, hmm, it does not have thickness, but it is a weird abstract object. And then we go to lines, it does not have thickness, we cannot possibly see it anywhere. Okay, surface, we can see that surface, we can read paper things and stuff like that, but where is the line? Maybe someone will say a rod, but a rod is a solid. Then comes the point, oh man, I, I personally still don't understand how does we, how do we even locate a point when we cannot see it? But that is a different topic now. So, we can see something may be logically prior or something may be prior relative to, to us. But the problem occurs when the relativity cheats us, cheats us. Suppose I understand logic better and you do not. So, I will understand the relatively prior things better in logical sense than you. So, the, rela the single relatively prior definition will give different results for each person. So, that is why it is much more important to or uh, it is much much better to talk about logical priority instead of relative. Okay, it follows that therefore, a thing should be must or should be or must be defined by means of absolutely prior or not the relatively prior in order that there may be one sole and immutable definition. That is one very important thing and that is exactly why Euclid gives sort of two definitions of line and points, uh, first logically prior and then relatively prior to humans. We will go to that as we move on. Now, Aristotle talks a lot about unscientific definition. First of all, a definition of a thing which is defined by means of its opposite. You cannot define good in terms of bad because you need to then define bad in terms of good and that is a circular reasoning, we do not like that. So, of course, do not do stuff in terms of their opposites. Second, the kind of definition which is based on what is not prior. We have talked about that previously. If you do not know what a line is, how will we draw a square really or how will we prove the Pythagorean theorem. Next, the third type which is not prior in the def which is which is not prior is the definition of one of the two coordinate species. This is a bit confusing and I still myself find it confusing because it says that you cannot define odd in terms of even because odd are even like coordinate things. I do not really understand it. So, if you if someone of you understand it better than me or I am showing the page of the book now. So, read it up and just explain it to me. 
frankly teach me yeah this is pretty much it then there is a small article about aristotle's third requirement which i don't really get which i don't really think it is really necessary so okay now we wrap up and finally i mentioned some definitions which are not used afterwards like euclid defines oblong rhombus rhomboid and then he never uses it later on stuff like that when we will go to the definitions we will see them in much more detail and so yeah that's that's for today hope you found the definitions pretty good and hopefully the discussions were pretty productive and good for you if you like the video like consider subscribing share it to your friends teachers pets dogs cats fishes monkeys in the zoo and whatever thanks for watching that's it